Okay, can you, can you, hi, how are you doing? Yes, are you warm and cozy? Are you cozy? Oh, that works. Yes, they're happy chickens. Hey everybody, and welcome back to channel we are going to talk a little Cornish cross action today um, before we get started on that we have been a little absent from videos and that is basically just because it's this time of year where things you know we're getting into spring and projects are already massive and with everything happening in the world um, I'm under a little more pressure because I know where this is going um, I've been studying it for a very long time, uh, about a decade now, and I know where this road ends. Uh, there's going to be a lot of variability in that, but ultimately it's going to go to one direction, and that direction is not good for everybody living inside the United States. So I'm trying to make those preparations as well as um, I live in the West, and the West is crazy wildfire. And then those are only going to increase this year, um, I almost guarantee it, because of reasons I won't discuss on YouTube. So I've been trying to cut down, you know, I, I, every single morning I get up at like 5 a.m. and then I try to wake up, get my body going, and then like 6, 6.30, I try to spend like 30 to 45 minutes doing clearing out there before I do the chores and make breakfast and all that stuff. So been super busy and uh, stressed out to get our property a little more fireproof this year, especially with the added animals we have and the added responsibility of uh, growing food for other people and all that kind of stuff. So, so these are our Cornish crosses that we got, and um, we got 100 of them. And I'm actually went to make this video yesterday, and I'm glad I didn't because I got new information regarding these heat plates here. Um, the Cornish crosses are, the, you know, your typical. Cornish Cross is what most of the poultry in the United States is, vast majority, 98% come from these birds. Now, uh, you can get them, you know, medicated and vaccinated and all that stuff or not. We wanted some of those things not done to our birds before we got them. So we got these like super fast growing ones, which we've never had before, which are six to nine week. Generally, we get the eight to 10 week birds and I never run them that fast. Okay, so my survival rate once we hit the field is like 99.8%. I mean, I rarely lose, a, I lost one last year when they were first out on the pasture to a predator. Something reached a paw in there and I made a mistake. I didn't have a hole plugged and the birds were real small at that point and I lost one. That's the only, and I think maybe the year before I had one that went lame on me, but it's been one bird each year that I, once I've gotten them out onto the field and um those with the eight to ten week and i have that success because i don't gorge the bird so um i generally do my first butcher on the eight to ten week birds i do my first butcher at 10 weeks my last butcher is at like 13 weeks and so i kind of ration them a little bit so that their digestive tract is not completely getting gorged all the time and they are being a little more active um, when I move them because I move them twice a day on the fresh ground. So I get them, you know, a little more hungry and they're going and looking for the bugs and looking for the grass and they're moving their legs around. And that also helps keep them, uh, keeps their legs from, uh, they get so heavy so fast, sometimes their legs are too weak and they just kind of go lame, right? And they're, they get all bow-legged and they can't hold themselves up anymore. Well, encouraging them to forage more builds those leg muscles up and helps them keep up with the weight that they're putting on in their upper body. So um, that's just the way I've done it. I've had a lot more success giving a couple extra weeks of grow time for these birds to reach maturity rather than trying to like give them on this really strict, you know, you're going to get X amount of ounces of food per bird every single day. I don't do that. Um, I kind of eyeball it, to be honest with you. And, uh, and generally speaking, by the time it's done, each bird's had about 12 pounds of feed, which is pretty normal. Some people are up closer to 14. So it's not, um, you know, it's not like they're not getting the same amount of feed. I just kind of stretch it out a little bit more. Uh, but with these birds, these new six to nine weekers, and I don't know if it's because of the heat plate or if it's because of the bird and, you know, having them genetically, um, their genetic disposition to be this aggressive I had seven birds that I've lost so far. First day, it was just one, which is pretty normal with that travel, two days in a box, get in an airplane and all that. That's pretty normal, okay, to lose one, two, maybe even three. 
but these heat plates are great alternatives to the heat lamp because if you're in a structure uh, like right now we're in the garage and I'll talk about the spruder here in a second um, but we're in the garage so these heat lamps tend to explode and catch fires and do all kinds of bad stuff especially once they get dusty or if a bird once the birds start getting flighty and they fly into it and knock it around so I don't run that at night while we're sleeping because heaven forbid I mean I've seen enough videos my wife showing me enough things about people's barns burning down and houses catching on fire and all kinds of stuff so we turn that off at night and I have these heat plates which have been great up to this point and that's why I'm saying I ran the layers under these uh, when we had layer chicks and they were they were fantastic but I think what happened is is when I turned this heat lamp off too many went under one heat plate this one in specifically and they couldn't quite like the ones in the very middle because they were all towards the center that had died and I think they didn't have areas to escape so they you know too many birds tried to get underneath there uh when those birds got too hot and needed to get a drink or whatever they couldn't get out and so you know they ended up perishing which is just oh it's it's so bad i i, I absolutely hate that because I, I know how to raise these birds and i know how to keep them from dying and um so that was a little frustrating when you're using a new product and uh you know there's just some things that i wasn't expecting i thought two heat plates would be good um, but we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce a seedling mat and the seedling mat is just going to be, you know, it's like a, this wide by yay long. And it's just going to give maybe 15, 20 of those birds a good spot to lay down on the heat. And that'll pull some more pressure off of the heat plates. Cause obviously the light is doing that right now. So it'll serve the same purpose without the risk of fire until I come out here first thing in the morning and unplug that and turn the heat lamp back on. So we're going to play it that way. Um, another thing I noticed with these fast growing birds too is that uh, a couple times I've seen a bird and it's been like off in la-la land not realizing that it's really thirsty. Like I'll see it and it's kind of just like wobbling around and sitting under the heat and I'm like that bird doesn't look all that peppy like the rest of them. So I'll grab it and I'll take it over to the water and dip its beak and then it just starts like drinking like crazy. Like, oh, I forgot to drink. So I don't think these birds are very smart. Chickens don't have that many brains to begin with. And now we've got these chickens, um, you know, genetically selected chickens here. And these ones seem to be my dumbest batch of birds I've ever gotten. And we would have gone with the normal eight to 10, but like I said, they were basically shooting up every one of those birds and we didn't want that. So these birds were specifically marked. They were actually had a food grade dye, like a beet based dye. Each bird was marked because they were specific to us to not get that done. Um, so unfortunately, uh, it looks like these might have some more issues. So I'm really going to have to just stay on top of things. And, and I, I will certainly raise them slower just for that reason. Because if they're not even smart enough to really get a drink when they need a drink... <laughs> Uh, we'll need to monitor them quite a bit, but we'll see how it goes. They're young. We've had them for here for three days, so it's not, uh, we're not losing birds two or three weeks. And if we were, then that would be a serious, that would be something that would really concern me. And uh, maybe we just got a weak batch. That happens too. So um, you can expect that when you order these, you're going to get generally two extra birds for every 50 you order. So even though we've lost the seven birds, we should be at 97 right now, 96, 97, if I counted correctly when we first got them. Um, but uh, this will be, in, you can watch my previous videos. I have videos from last year about like with the birds in the field. So if you watch this and you just want to go straight to raising or to watching the birds be raised, you can you can go up to those videos. I should have uh, quite a few out there with uh, with the meat chickens the last two years. Um, but this is very important for a few reasons, okay? So we ordered 100 because we figure we'll keep 50, one a week basically, and we're gonna sell the rest. Uh, we also are hosting a couple butchering classes this year in which someone will come, learn how to process the birds, and they will get a chicken when they leave. And we're way undercharging for that service, by the way. <laughs> So let's start off with that. Um, no, let's let, let's um, let's start with the supply chains and the meat situation that's going on in the United States. Like we've wore out the supply chain the last two years. There's been tons of fumbles and bumbles. Uh, we've had tons of farmers who didn't grow the last two years. So we've had our worst crops in 2018. Then it was worse 2019. It was way worse in 2020. 
and it was pretty darn bad. I think it was the same, if not slightly worse, in 2021 than it was in 2022. So we're now working on four years of backed, uh, of failed crops, basically, from what our standard in this country has been. Now, we don't need to go into all the issues, the soil degradation and all that stuff. A lot of it's been a supply chain issue, and now we have a massive fertilizer issue on top of it. So the grain for these birds is going up significantly. Um, we have, luckily, we have a local feed company that sources from all over eastern Washington and Idaho, and we get a decent price on feed here. This is not the case. I've seen places that charge well over twice of what we get it for in other parts of the country, so I'm very grateful for that. Still, my feed price is up 35% in one year. So um, that means that to raise these meat chickens, instantaneously, the largest cost you have, which is your food imp input, is now 35% up from the get-go. Now, it's not like the feed is up, but your chicken in the store is still the same price. I mean, meat prices in the stores are going to go ballistic, and we're still, like I said before, we're eating last year's stuff. So once we start rolling in this year's stuff, the shortages will really, really kick in. So I encourage anybody to just dive in, you know, even if it's like 25 of these birds, raise them for yourself. It's super easy to do, and we're going to need to do it because we will absolutely 100% have people in this country that cannot get meat, okay? Um, we can say all the reasons. This is, I'll just say this. I'm without going conspiratorial. It's not an accident, okay? So I'll just leave it at that for going down that road uh, as we're here on YouTube, but... And if you can't, if you don't have a spot to run these chickens, um, because you do need a decent lawn without chemicals on it or a field, because you will need to move them at least once a day, I do it twice a day, um, then, you know, find, there's going to be somebody local to you that will do this and will, and will raise these birds and maybe they want to raise them more and they really want to get into farming, um, so you could be their customer. These birds are unlike anything you will ever find in the store. You cannot find anything that touches the quality of these birds when you raise them, them when you raise them yourself. You just will not find it. People can say, "Well, I buy organic birds, or I buy a free-range organic chicken." The stuff you buy, in the, it doesn't even come close. Number one, organic and free-range commercial outfits still always bleach their chickens because they don't want to get sued for bacterial issues. Because generally, even when they're labeled free-range, they're not really free-range. That's nonsense. Uh, they have like a door and they can go get sunlight. That's about the extent of it. Um, and they're still way crowded and they're still getting, you know, fecal particulate in the air. And so that stuff gets into the bloodstream, gets into the meat. So after they butcher these chickens, they bleach them. Sometimes up to 25 times in a bleach bath before they get packaged and put on the shelf. So you're eating the bleach. And of course that does wonders for your gut biome. So um, that's just something you need to remember and also organic doesn't really mean anything other than they got organic feed Doesn't address living conditions Doesn't address the fact that probably majority 80% of their feed is corn and a soy mix which those are Some of the worst things to put in your body unless they're raised really well, which almost nobody does that nobody <laughs> really raises those crops in the right way at least on a you know large scale um and so with that, you're going to have certain things like vitamin K and uh, just the, the, the healthy to bad fat ratio is completely flipped in these birds to the beneficial side. You eat these things instead of, you know, commercially raised meats, your cholesterol will drop because that's cholesterol is an imbalance of your, of your omega-3s and omega-6s and your good fat, bad fat. And so, you know, that's just one of many things. I mean, there's people who get unsick by eating, you know, market garden, fresh food and pasture raised meats and eggs and things like that. And they completely cure diseases they've had for decades, you know, chronic inflammation diseases and diabetes and all it goes on and on and on. Because so many of us, even if we think we're eating well, we have nutritional deficiencies that it's very hard to supplement for because um, it's unless you're doing lots of testing and all that stuff. So these, it's not even close. I mean, they're going to cost anywhere from like 15 to 17 bucks on the low end. If you can find someone who's willing to raise these in a pasture poultry manner and they're selling them to you for 15 or $17, buy it all day, every day. Okay. That is as cheap as it's going to get. That person's not paying themselves correctly. That's what I charged for them last year. Okay. So I'm saying that from experience. All the way up to, you'll have companies that part these out, especially in California and Texas and stuff, with they like, you know, 
cut up the chicken breast and the legs and the bones for stock, they'll part out a bird at $45, $47 a piece. Um, and that's because it's just the nutritional density in these things are insane. Um, I like to compare it to like, if you had a great grandfather who had an apple tree, say it's a Fuji apple, whatever, or a golden delicious, um, that probably had up to 50 times the nutritional density as something you buy in the store today. That is how far our soils have, uh, have degraded in this country from the way we farm. So one apple, you need 50 apples over here to get the same nutritional, you know, trace minerals and all that kind of stuff that this, that this apple had, you need 50 of these. And that is across the board, you know, cause great grandfather's tree was behind his beautiful worm filled topsoil with long lush grass. And you know, the fruit's been falling every year and composting in there and the worms are eating it and all that good stuff. So it's just, it's the same thing with this. You know, and I bring that up because a lot of people, you know, tout the heritage breeds, which are, you know, they're a flightier bird. They don't grow as fast. Um, there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Just it's more of a darker meat. It's just a different, different um, taste. But even these birds, when you go to eat them, they almost taste like they've been pre-buttered because for the first time you're eating a chicken that's got the proper um, balance of fats, the healthy fats in there. Um, so... The heritage breeds aren't inherently better for you. 98% of what you do with these is not the breed you start with, it's how they're raised from the time they're born. Okay, so that is what we're really focusing on. So I'll end the video by talking a little bit about the brooder. So last year I built this big extravagant wood brooder and then I had to take it all down. Half the wood was ruined and it was a mess to clean up and it was a pain in the butt. So then last year I was like, I'll never raise chickens in my garage again. I need to get a shed built for specifically for raising chicks because we do it quite often. That didn't happen. So we're back in the garage. Um, but I use cinder blocks this time, all right? And then just pine shavings, don't use cedar, pine shavings on the floor. And that way, you know, when I'm done, I can just keep adding pine shavings, but then I just, I'm gonna take a scoop shovel, scoop it right out and take it out of the garage. So super easy. I'm gonna add cinder blocks here as I need them. So these birds are gonna get a little flightier. We only have two down here. So probably in the next three or four days, they're gonna be able to start jumping up on this uh, second uh, cinder block here. So I've got plenty of cinder blocks. So I'm just gonna add another cinder block. And then probably the next week after that, I'll add another cinder block. Hopefully I don't have to go any higher than four because that's gonna be a lot of cinder blocks to move. But um, I'm really happy with it. I think it's gonna be so much easier to clean up and the cinder blocks aren't damaged, so I'm not wasting any material. They're perfectly usable for whatever I need to use them for next. Uh, this is a wood brooder I had built for layers. So that's just, they can go in that around this backside here. So I just added it for extra square footage. I threw it in here. Um, so you wanna do one square foot of space per bird. Uh, we are at 96, 97 birds. I only have about 85 square feet, so I'm a little short but I will move the largest, fastest growing, most aggressive birds onto the field first. And then the rest of them will probably be in here for three or four more days after that, maybe even five or six more days, just depends on their physical condition and the weather. And um, at that point, you know, I've relieved pressure off the brooder and it'll be a non-issue. So, um, but theoretically just keep that in mind, one square foot per bird that you're raising uh, when you're raising meat birds. So. With that said, I did want to touch, we are we are looking into getting a sustainable bird, like a Jersey Giant or the Red Rangers, I think is what they're called. Um, they're a heritage breed that's uh, known for being raised as a meat bird as well. But of course, the hatchery we use won't sell you the females because they don't want competition, I guess. Um, so I'm trying to find a good dual purpose breed that I can raise meat birds and layers off of the same same bird. So that in a worst case scenario, and I can't get birds from a hatchery anymore, we have a sustainable flock that all I have to do is figure out how to feed and I can keep pumping out birds for the community here and for our own family. So uh, that is the plan going forward. And um, we will uh, continue to update you on the, the journey of these wonderful meat birds and uh, we'll get back to you sooner this time. So sorry about the delay, but I appreciate you watching and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.